Hello, my name is Katharina Rebel salesbury I'm Professor of Prehistory of Humanity at the University of Vienna, and today I would like to talk about gender, kinship and the plague, bioarchaeological insights into early Bronze Age Austria. Mother-child relations are perhaps the most important basis of social relationships more broadly, and I was fortunate to run an ESC starting grant project called The Value of Mothers to Society between 2016 and 2021. We investigated social responses to pregnancy, birth and early childbearing in the Bronze and Iron Ages and tried to relate the social to the reproductive status of prehistoric women. I would like to stress that biological relatedness is not the same as kinship, and that the archaeological context is really crucial to understand social relations. Often we watch in which way persons are buried in relation to each other, which shows us emotional and social ties. In my opinion, the interpretation of the context and the ADNA analysis together provide the best insights into family structures. These are just two maps for orientation. In early Bronze Age Europe, we have a large central complex called the Aunitids culture that bury their dead in flex position, primarily on the right body side, head south. And along the Rhine, south of the Danube and further east, people practice gendered burial, differentiating between men and women in the way they buried their bodies. We took 168 samples for ancient DNA analysis from Eastern Austrian sites from both cultural groups. The example I want to talk about today is an early Bronze Age Onnitid cemetery at Brasenhofen, which was excavated in 2018 in the course of a motorway extension in northern Lower Austria, near the Czech and Slovak borders. 25 individuals were found buried in 22 graves, 19 single graves, one grave with two individuals, one grave with four individuals, and one empty grave. There were also settlement pits in the near vicinity with human remains. That's not particularly unusual in this cultural context, but it has been very difficult to understand how the individuals in pits relate to the ones buried in the small graves groups. There are 12 male and 13 female individuals in total, a balanced gender ratio, and all age groups are represented from neonates to mature individuals. The top and the bottom rows of graves are undisturbed or barely disturbed, the central area, in contrast, has most of the graves reopened and body parts have been rearranged. It's not a very rich cemetery. There are few grave goods, such as ceramic cups and bowls, animal bones, some jewelry made of bone and mollusks, and a little bronze. This is just to give you an impression of the spectrum of material culture associated with these burials. We have some bronze wire arm rings, some noppen rings, a few dress pins, handmade ceramics. We sampled all available individuals for ancient human and pathogen DNA, starting with teeth and supplementing with petrous bones if the sample didn't yield enough endogenous human DNA. Anja Furtwängler from the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology is shown here sampling in Vienna, and she was able to identify two families to which most individuals with sufficient DNA coverage belonged. It seems at the moment that people were buried in the sequence of death. So we have a 30 to 39 year old male who is the father of two adult women. In this case, the adult women remained in the community, which is quite remarkable as many others show patrilocal uh, systems. The older woman is the mother of a newborn that was not buried in the grave of the mother, but with others in the quadruple grave further north. From the perspective of the newborn, the relations include the mother, an aunt, an uncle or a half-brother, a niece and the grandfather. Neonates are often just included in the last open grave, not necessarily with their closest relatives. The mother of the newborn was buried in the central part of the cemetery, at quite a distance to the baby. I've here included a picture of this mother the remains are not in original position, but they must have been manipulated and were arranged and deposited in the grave as some sort of bundle. The second family is also super interesting because the founding father was not actually found within the group, but outside the cemetery in a settlement pit. 
This founding father had a daughter who shared a grave with her son at the top right of the group. And the other son is individual 23 at the bottom row. And then there is a two to four year old niece that was buried next to him. And the 30 to 39 year old individual 19 is a third degree relative of the sons. So this is the ancestor. A 40 to 49 year old male discovered at the bottom of a storage pit near settlement structures at about 50 meter distance to the grave group. He was placed in a flexed position, clearly buried and not just disposed of in this pit. And what is really cool is that we can use these pedigrees in the cemetery to improve or C14 dates. All radium carbon dates are done from dental roots of molars, so we assume they relate to a similar age in the individual's biography. And with a simple sequence, we can here narrow down um, the graves to probably dates quite significantly. So we see that the deposition date of around 2000 is most likely for this group. We can then go back and use these chrono chronologies to double check or type of chronological sequences. We go back to the second family. We see that individual 19 is the mother of two children, a daughter who died between 17 and 19, and a son who died between 25 and 35 years of age. The children most likely survived their mother. If the mother was only around 20 when she had her babies, they were still children when she died. So this suggests that other members of the community must have been involved in taking care of and raising the children. Interestingly, we found evidence of the Yersinia pestis pathogen in two graves from Drasenhofen. At the moment, this is the oldest evidence of plague in Austria, and we've recently published the findings in the journal Archaeologia Austriaca. We can be fairly certain that the victims had actually died from the disease, as we can only detect Yersinia pestis once it had entered the bloodstream and had caused sepsis. Although both plague victims were found in the same cemetery, the pathogen analysis detected two different strains of plague bacteria at different positions in the phylogenetic tree. So it was not an infection that was transmitted within the Bronze Age community, but in different infection events. The late Neolithic early Bronze Age plague most likely caused lung disease. It was not yet adapted to the transmission via fleas and rats as vectors, but it was more directly transmitted. Both of victims were adult males, and a quick look at other plague victims from Eurasia confirmed that significantly more males than females died of plague in the Bronze Age. So we wanted to see if the males were involved in gendered activities that took them further away from their homes, such as hunting or herding, that would have made an infection more likely. However, we couldn't detect any evidence for mobility in the strontium isotope ratios of the plague victims. They all look fairly local. The women, however, as in most Bronze Age case studies, moved around more than men during adolescence. So in many ways, Dresdenhofen has been an ideal case study because the number of individuals is low enough that one can really do all types of analysis on all individuals and still afford to pay for it. With genetic kinship analysis, each individual can reveal multiple more connections. So bringing all these archaeological observations and bioarchaeological analysis together lets the Bronze Age people emerge from the data. So thank you. This slide is to thank all my team members, collaborators and funding institutions that have contributed to the work in the last few years. Thank you.